Few people in film history are more fascinating, infuriating, and complex than Orson Welles. The filmmaker's legacy marked not only the movies, but radio, theater, and pop culture. However, Welles' life story contains just as much tragedy and missed opportunity as it does drama and brilliance. Before he was even 10 years old, Orson Welles had experienced some serious upsets in his young life. He was born to Richard Welles and Beatrice Ives in Kenosha, Wisconsin in 1915. His parents separated when he was four, and Beatrice died when he was nine. Not long after, he was admitted to the Todd School, a preparatory academy that offered him intellectual advancement and an educational philosophy that encouraged creativity amongst its students. However, this move also meant that Wells moved to Illinois, separating him from his family at what was surely a vulnerable time in his life. Richard would die in 1930, orphaning a teenage Orson who then became the ward of a family friend. Young Wells was also an artistic prodigy. He played piano and violin, wrote poetry, made visual arts, and seemed pretty inclined towards the dramatic arts. Yet, he was also a sickly child. Wells was born with a spinal issue that caused numerous health problems. He also had, according to at least one childhood doctor, the spooky ability to weigh in on the philosophy of medicine from the comfort of his crib. Though Orson Welles was striking enough to make an impression on people like his childhood doctors and high school teachers, he didn't really come to wider attention until 1938. That's when Wells, along with CBS Radio's The Mercury Theater on the Air, broadcast an adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel The War of the Worlds. Yet, where Wells' novel was plainly fictional, Orson's broadcast was a different beast altogether. Presented as if it were breaking news, the program presented itself as an on-the-ground account of a real extraterrestrial invasion of Earth. It certainly seemed that way to some listeners, who promptly freaked out and assumed that the world was ending. Later examinations of the incident indicate that reports of mass hysteria were probably overblown, but it is nevertheless clear that Orson Welles became a notorious figure in the aftermath. You think you might have taken advantage of the public? I simply don't know. I can't imagine an invasion from Mars would find ready acceptance. Welles was only 23 at the time and would spend much of his life either apologizing for the turmoil he'd caused or cheekily hinting that he knew it would be a mess all along. Today, Orson Welles is probably best known for his 1941 film Citizen Kane. The movie, which follows the life of a newspaper magnate character closely modeled on the real-life mogul William Randolph Hearst, has since been widely hailed as one of the greatest movies of all time. It also proved to be a millstone around Welles' neck for the rest of his life. The problem was that a young Welles was given broad creative control over Citizen Kane, an unprecedented move for the time. Even more extraordinary was the fact that, at only 25, Welles was a first-time director. Much as he might have been riding the high of this honor, the release of Citizen Kane was disappointing, getting good reviews, but not many ticket sales. It didn't help that Hearst himself realized that he was the inspiration for Kane and, being rather sore about it, banned mention of the movie in all of his newspapers. Wells believed that the film's initial flop set the stage for his later struggles with studios over who was supposed to make his movies. Citizen Kane effectively spoiled the self-involved Wells for all other collaborative filmmaking experiences. As a result, he later called Citizen Kane, quote, the greatest curse of my life. I was spoiled in a very strange way. I didn't know what was ahead of me. Like quite a few other creative folks in the mid-century American film industry, Wells was a generally pretty progressive person. And like so many of those people, they soon ran into trouble in some circles for having the wrong sorts of views in an increasingly tense and image-conscious world. Orson Welles was about to butt heads with the Hollywood blacklist. As history reports, Welles was put under investigation by the FBI, in part because Citizen Kane was interpreted as a thinly veiled critique of William Randolph Hearst, an anti-communist newspaper mogul. Under this line of reasoning, anyone who didn't like Hearst was therefore a potential communist themselves. Never mind that, as The New Yorker points out, Welles was not a member of the Communist Party and hadn't done much political organizing beyond some leftist scripts and plays. Well, I'm 86% communist. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is capitalist. <laughs> However, Wells was still put on a watch list and later included in the Red Channel's pamphlet, a list of 151 artists and journalists whom right-wing commentators believed were helping the communist cause in the United States. Yet, by the time the pamphlet came out in 1950, Wells was already in Europe, having left a film industry he had already deemed overly restrictive. He was, in many ways, already in exile and beyond the reach of the Red Scare. After Citizen Kane, much of Orson Welles' filmmaking career was marred by constant struggles with film studios over who exactly was to make the films that would bear his credit. Though Welles would eventually admit that he did in fact need to collaborate to some extent with other people in order to make a movie, he wanted to always be the quote, dominant personality. 
Unfortunately, this often meant that Wells intentionally destabilized productions with endless rewrites and reshoots, thus prolonging the struggles he was having with studios. As a result of these struggles, Wells often undertook independent projects that gave him control, but they were frequently held back by poor funding and planning. Wells was forced to play along in other productions, including a starring role in the 1949 film noir The Third Man. Yet he must have always been thinking of his real and oftentimes frustrating work, like the on-again, off-again, constantly cash-strapped production for his adaptation of Shakespeare's Othello. At least that film got released in 1952, unlike some of his other troubled projects that would remain unfinished at the time of his death. Like so many Hollywood stars, Orson Welles was forced to fret over his image. According to Orson Welles, a biography written by Barbara Learning, the issue started at least as early as his involvement with Citizen Kane. Wells went on crash diets to slim down for the role. One diet had him eating only bananas and milk. Other diets were a steady supply of pills loaded with amphetamines, as author Simon Cowell's 2006 book Orson Welles' Hello Americans reports. Early on, Wells was enthusiastic about the effects of diet pills, though he later recognized that these were a hasty choice in an era before everyone admitted that packing your body full of amphetamines was pretty bad for one's health. Later on in his career, Orson Welles appears to have discarded the diets and allowed his weight to balloon. Wells was notorious for his love of fattening steaks and ate them regularly, to the point where his considerable girth became part of Wells' image. It was part of a long-lasting caricature of him, perhaps as persistent and potentially damaging to Wells the man as his association with Citizen Kane. He was, for many, the cartoonish image of a louche, overweight film auteur, and less so a complicated human being dealing with weight issues, like so many others both then and today. Even though Orson Welles died in 1985, it appears that his first film, Citizen Kane, is still haunting his legacy today. That's because everyone feels obligated to talk about it when discussing Welles. It's the pinnacle of filmmaking, many say, and an absolute highlight of Welles' career. Yet, it's possible that for each time someone talks on and on about Kane, they're missing another opportunity to discuss the film that Welles himself considered his very best. That work would be Chimes at Midnight, a quasi-adaptation of Shakespeare's Henry V that focuses on the fat, riotous, and entirely made-up character of Falstaff, young Prince Hal's best friend and mentor. According to The New Yorker, for a long while, it was notoriously difficult to find a decent copy of the film, which is a real shame. Chimes at Midnight shows the combination of grandiosity and self-awareness in Falstaff that was also arguably part of Wells' own sense of himself, of a man who was eventually overcome by the caricature of himself. It's also just a good movie. As the Folger Shakespeare Library notes, it's full of Wells' trademark inventiveness and passion, from smart camera moves to excellent acting. Wells himself, of course, stars as Falstaff. He was, by all accounts, awfully proud of this particular work, telling the Columbia Journal, If I wanted to get into heaven on the basis of one movie, that's the one I would offer up. At a certain point in his life, it was clear that Orson Welles wasn't going to be conventional. Early on, as a child prodigy and wunderkind producer, it was clear that he was ready to push intellectual and artistic boundaries. And as he aged, Wells made it pretty clear that he wasn't especially committed to social conventions either. Wells was married three times and had three children. The first marriage to actress Virginia Nicholson happened when he was only 19. However, Wells was never terribly faithful. So what if the pair had eloped in what must have been a spontaneous act of romance or at least impulsiveness? Wells was already carrying on affairs with other women soon into the marriage, a pattern he repeated continuously throughout his life. That reportedly ruined his second marriage to Rita Hayworth, who dropped him for cheating on her by 1948. He then married Italian actress Paola Mori in 1955. Though he paired up with actress and artist Oyo Kodar for the last 24 years of his life, he often took his leave of her and returned to Paola. Wells' three daughters were painfully cognizant of their father's artistic achievements and of his failures as a parent. Chris Wells Fetter, his oldest daughter, wrote in My Father's Shadow that he was both, quote, a great creative force and a dad who often wasn't there. Later in life, Orson Welles lent his distinctive voice to a series of commercials that ultimately tarnished his reputation and contributed to the cartoonish pop culture pictures of Welles as a self-involved, ridiculous blowhard. The Palmasan wine advertisements of the 1970s and 1980s included outtakes of a supposedly drunk Welles slurring his way through the ad copy. Ah, the French champagne has always been celebrated for its excellence. The possibility that he might have been tired, overly medicated, or simply too grouchy to play a long shilling wine on television doesn't really matter, at least not for people who prefer to laugh at the commercial takes today. Another set of outtakes from a frozen pea commercial underscore Wells' difficulty relinquishing control even while doing hack work. Why should he care about the setting and story for an ad that was just trying to get housewives to throw a particular brand of peas into their shopping carts? But as Mental Floss reports, Wells cared anyway. 
Of course, he could have also backed off somewhat and consented to multiple takes, as the beleaguered audio engineer asked him to do in the recording. Even the commanding baritone of Orson Welles doesn't sound terribly respectable when he's railing about grammar rules and calling the commercial directors pests. Instead, Welles comes across as a petty tyrant when, just maybe, he could have played along for once and quietly collected his check at the end. But that just wasn't Orson. At the time of his death in 1985, Welles left behind a large number of unfinished film projects. These are perhaps one of the most tragic details of Welles' life, given how the complicated, difficult filmmaker was so intensely devoted to his work. They were also, as the British Film Institute notes, mostly independent projects that reflected the endless, lifelong war of creative control that Wells waged with other film studios. One of the oldest projects was a 1939 adaptation of Joseph Conrad's novella Heart of Darkness, while Wells had been more directly working on a 1980s film version of King Lear when he died. Some of these attempts are little more than enigmatic fragments, like the test footage for Heart of Darkness. Others were close to completion, like the film that would be released as The Other Side of the Wind in 2018. Quite a few were incredibly frustrating simply because we never got to see the completed project, like the on-again, off-again Don Quixote film that Wells started in 1955 and was still talking about revisiting decades later. Sadly, he never got the chance to finally finish it. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite filmmakers are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.